let's get started. So uh, welcome everyone to, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, so welcome everyone to a presentation uh, for the graduate research program in biomedical engineering at NUS. All right, so uh, my name is Tony and my colleague here, uh, Xue Lu, we are co-managers of the BME graduate program. And uh, so we'll be giving you a brief introduction today about the program. And uh, uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, two uh, professors from NUS BME, uh, Professor Eliza Fong and Professor Andy Te. So they will be uh, giving you uh, an overview of the research in uh, NUS uh, BME. All right. So, uh, I will go through a brief introduction of the program. And if you have any questions, uh, you may type into the chat and we will have a general uh, panel Q&A uh, questions and answers uh, at the end of these sessions. Okay, so uh, yeah, so why do we, you know, so NUS BME, so we are research, uh, we are department in, uh, in a college of design and engineering of NUS. So, uh, you know, I will be very brief here. So NUS uh, BME uh, is a uh, very well known internationally, like by, by most uh, metrics, right? uh, as you know, as top uh, research uh, department, both at the global and, and, and regional level. So we have uh, many uh, faculties who are performing uh, you know, uh, state-of-the-art research in many different areas. I just uh, listed a few here in biomaterials, uh, regenerative medicine, biomedical imaging, nanotechnology, biomechanics, biomedical robotics, and biomedical devices, right? So we are very well established uh, department with, you know, uh, uh, top faculty members, uh, I won't have enough time to go into every one of them, but I'm sure you can find on on you know on the website and so on. And we have a world class research research facilities and uh, and yeah, and we interact very closely with industry as well as you know we have a ongoing collaboration with uh, many uh, international uh, uh, internationally well known. Uh, universities and research institutes. So, um, well, uh, I will go very briefly through the structures of the program uh, that we offer for a research based and postgraduate program. So, we have a PhD program and an engineering doctorate program. Right. So, PhD uh, program is the you know, is the traditional you know research based. A program, whereas the engineering doctorate program is primarily aimed for uh, uh, industry uh, industry uh, professionals who want to, you know, perform uh, uh, doctoral research as part of their uh, industry career. So the duration of the PhD program is four years. It involves uh, uh, six at least six graduate modules and a few important components such as a research seminar and uh, the key for the uh, PhD program is a qualifying examinations. So there are two qualifying examinations uh, which uh, we expect students to complete in the first uh, two years. So these are comprehensive written examinations and uh, oral defense, right? And then you know, students uh, uh, perform research in the in the supervisor laboratory, and and then uh, write the thesis and and you know uh, the, uh, and uh, defend that thesis. Right. So the duration of PhD at the NUS is uh, typically about four years. We also have a master's by research program. This is called Master of Engineering or MEng. So the duration of the program is two years. Right. So this involves. Um, at least a full graduate modules or, or 16 plus MCs, right? And uh, there are seminar and presentations components as well as a thesis as well. And importantly, uh, the MN uh, students can be upgraded to PhD upon you know, passing 
the qualifying uh, examination, right? So uh, for more details, we have a lot more information on the website of uh, NGS BME, right? So uh, this is, you know, just a very quick overview, right? And uh, so to, for admission requirements to, to our PhD and MNG program, so uh, for bachelor's degree, uh, we expect a bachelor's degree with honors at least the second class upper or equivalent level, right? For, for PhD or uh, for MNG, uh, this can be at the second class uh, lower or equivalent. So that's the bachelor's degree right, from a related uh, discipline, right, biomedical engineering or, or related uh, science and engineering field. Uh, we also require a, a test, a standardized test. This include the TOEFL test or IELTS or a GIE test. So GIE score of a minimum of 320 right, is, uh, is expected or a TOEFL score of uh, uh, at least 85 or the L score of uh, 6.0, right? And uh, additional supporting materials uh, for, for application, this include uh, recommendation letters from, from uh, those who can, you know, uh, write about your research uh, and your, your academic performance. And if you have uh, prior research publications, this will be uh, very, uh, very helpful, right? And any awards and also a personal statement. So for more details, uh, you you can go to a uh, uh, BME uh, website for 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 more information. All right. So uh, and yeah. So uh, for for applications, uh, uh, importantly, uh, we strongly suggest that candidates uh, identify prospective supervisor right, by going to our website to to look for a supervisor who who you know who, who whose research yeah, you are you are very interested in. So at the US we have uh, two intakes, so January intake and uh, August intake, right? So these are the deadlines and these are the website for the application process, right? And uh, so importantly for scholarship for. For a PhD, right? Uh, uh, these uh, there are multiple sources of, of scholarship for your PhD study, and I encourage you to contact your uh, prospective uh, PhD or MN supervisor for, for more information about these scholarships. But there are also additional sources of scholarship for for joining uh, a BME lab. These include. Uh, the SINGA scholarship program is a uh, graduate scholarship program and also the ISEC, right? So these, uh, you can uh, look up for that information here, right? So, all right, so yeah, without, uh, you know, uh, so, so, so these are these are very brief uh, overview of our program. So, and in the remaining time, I would like to invite you know, our professors to go into a, uh, more details about you know specific research area and uh, share with you you know exciting uh, research that's happening at uh, NUS BME. So first, I would like to invite our post Professor Fong. Yeah, Eliza. All right. Thanks, to Tony. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I will have to share my screen. All right. I stop yeah. sharing now. Okay. Give me one second. All right, so uh, hi everyone. I trust you can see my screen. Um, thanks for joining us uh, here this afternoon. So I guess uh, Andy and myself will represent the department to share with you some of the work that's ongoing um, in BME, but of course there's a lot of other exciting um, uh, 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 projects that, you know, in other uh, labs as well. So today, um, I'd like to share with you what we actually do in a TTE lab. I'm sure many of you here that are interested in pursuing further studies in, um, in uh, BME are interested in making a difference to human health, right? And so what we do in uh, my lab is we try to either reconstruct or to maintain 
patient tumors in vitro or ex vivo for the purpose of personalizing uh, cancer medicine. Okay, so let me just put things in the context, you know, why do we need such um, patient avatars for personalizing cancer medicine? So in the cancer clinic, this is just a, a fictional patient, but you imagine many patients are actually uh, uh, in such situations where um, there are actually different um, drug regimens that may be available to the patient. So this um, is the case for colorectal cancer, ovarian cancer, and some other cancers. And these different drug regimens are actually derived from clinical trial cohort response, so not based on individual patients. And we know that different patients with the same cancer type may actually respond differently to the same drug. So how do we actually select the best drug for this particular patient so that the patient doesn't unnecessarily experience the side effects from drugs that are not going to work, right? So potentially, we can actually test these different drug um, regimens on these patient avatars before it is actually used um, in the patient. The other scenario that is quite common when the disease does progress um, is when the patient reaches the dead end. So essentially, you know, the, the patient is treated with first, second, sometimes third line um, center of care. And then essentially, you know, the tumor doesn't respond. I mean, the, the patient doesn't respond anymore and the patient just left to receive palliative care. What if we can actually grow out some part of the tumor uh, in vitro? Uh, okay, I guess someone was uh, not muted. It's okay. Um, so I was saying that what if we can actually grow some part of the patient tumor ex vivo or in vitro and then test further drug regimens that might be effective for the patient. So this area um, my, in my lab and other labs as well, around the world, we look at this as a form of um, uh, functional precision oncology, where the idea is to grow the patient tumor out and then use these patient avatars to identify drugs for the patient. So it's not an entirely very easy task uh, to grow patient tumors uh, in vitro. Um, you might imagine that it's just a bunch of proliferating cancer cells, but there's much more than that. Um, we now know, you know, through decades of research that these patient tumors are highly heterogeneous in composition and architecture. And there are certain features that we as bioengineers try to recapitulate in vitro. So in my lab, um, we make use of biomaterials to provide a conducive microenvironment to grow cancer cells as well as surrounding um, stromal cells. Um, some of the work you know, uh, is shown over here on this slide. You can look up uh, some of these um, uh, in our website. But essentially, we have made use of electrospun scaffolds, hydrogels, which are essentially water swollen um, uh, materials to grow cancer organoids and um, in conjunction also with stromal cells. Um, just to show you some examples over here, uh, in, this, in these two works over here, we made use of um, uh, bioengineered uh, hydrogels to grow organoids from prostate cancer as well as liver cancer. This is to show you, this is to show you one example of a macroporous um, uh, scaffold that we were able to use to culture different patient-derived uh, liver, liver, liver cancer organoids. And then um, we have also made use of these biomaterials to engineer the cancer stromal crosstalk. So as you might already know, um, tumors, they don't just contain cancer cells. There are immune cells in there, the vasculature, fibroblast cells in there, and collectively they do contribute to, uh, you know, the, the disease progression as well as drug resistance. So how do we actually capture some of these uh, interactions in our models? So some of the previous work, you know, um, we have shown how we can make use of tunable hydrogels uh, to incorporate some of these stromal cells, which are very important in deriving uh, accurate drug responses from the model. We've also done this for colorectal cancer through the introduction of fibroblast cells. And then most recently, we have also um, incorporated the blood vessel cells, which we showed um, in a recent study for liver cancer, that it actually contributes to uh, creating an inf inflammatory microenvironment. Um, and so some of these examples over here, I think uh, highlight to you how important it is to really um, develop such models and we can do it with biomaterials um, through 
modulation of material properties. So, uh, so in my in my lab right now, these are some of the projects that um, you know besides uh, recreating, uh, reconstructing some of these tumor models, we also have um, other projects where we actually make use of um, biomaterials to maintain some of these patient tumors ex vivo. So essentially, if you imagine once it's resected, we essentially just culture the pieces of these tumors ex vivo long enough to perform personalized drug testing. So if you're interested in making a difference as I, I, I am and my, my lab members are um, in being able to translate some of these uh, platform technologies to the clinic, please feel free to contact um, me. I would say that most of the projects in my lab closely interface with clinicians at the local cancer hospital, as well as the, in the pharma industry who are interested in using our models for um, you know, they're testing the drug targets. And so we aim to have this element of translation through, um, you know, this close interface with these major players. Um, and so, yeah, uh, this is just a, a pitch for my lab, but um, you can see that uh, our most of our BME labs are in a new and beautiful E7 building uh, that's located um, in the middle of campus. And um, we welcome uh, anyone that's interested uh, in, in our projects. And um, yeah, lastly, this is a, just a, a picture of um, one of the lab gatherings that happened just last week, you know, the, the first um, in-person lab gathering after two-ish years. So um, uh, very, very happy and, and, and um, uh, a bunch of uh, students and staff that work very closely together to make a difference, right? Um, we already see that some of our models are able to accurately predict response in patients. So that's all we want to see. We want to see some of the models really making a difference and we hope to find like-minded people that can um, help and join our team. Okay, so I think that's all from me, uh, Tony. Andy, are you? Yeah, good there. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, yep. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Eliza. So- Thanks. Uh, all right, so perhaps uh, maybe any quick questions from the audience before we move on to, to Andy. You can also ask uh, at the end of the session today, but you have any, any urgent questions for Eliza? Okay. All right, yeah, there's one question. Uh, any lab working on growing <laughs> tissue using 3D? Okay. Uh, yeah, so so my lab does that. Um, I'm not sure about Andy, but yeah, we uh, we we make use of uh, these three D um, biomaterials, right? Scaffolds or hydrogels to grow cancer cells. So yes. All right. Very good. So, uh, yep. Thank you. Uh, there's also I think there's also a few probably a few more labs. Uh, you can look at the uh, BME websites yeah, for, for specific research groups. All right, so uh, well, in the interest of time, so let's uh, proceed to the next uh, exciting talk from Andy Te. So Andy, please take it away. So let me share my presentation. So um, I realized that the audience uh, today might be a bit uh, broad and you may not have you know, specific background in biomedical engineering. So I'm really trying to explain um, my research in very layman term. So the title is how ordering food delivery has benefited my research. Um, so I'm Andy, I'm a currently a young uh, presidential young professor at NUS and also a peer at iHealth Tech. Um, the overall theme of my lab is on immunoengineering. And if you are keen to learn more about the research, you can scan this QR code. Um, but at the end of my talk, I will share again the QR code. So I'm sure during a you know, circuit breaker or lockdown in uh, wherever country you have been, uh, you must have ordered food delivery. And uh, during lockdown in Singapore, these are just some of the food items I've ordered. Um, so if you are foreign to Singapore, um, you may want to try this. If you are starting a graduate education in Singapore, you know, uh, we have our homegrown chocolate cake, um, chili crab, roti prata, and also our, our, our quite national favorite bubble tea. Um, and in doing so, um, when you're ordering food delivery, of course, you need to use a platform. Um, and in Singapore, there are three main ones like GrabFood, Deliveroo, and Foodpanda. And while I'm choosing, you know, which platform to use, I realize there are many factors to consider. 
For example, is the delivery going to be efficient? How much is it going to cost me? And is it going to give me additional stress? So I remember ordering a sushi and it came like three hours later. So I was really hungry and angry at the same time. But the reason I'm really talking about, you know, food delivery is really to draw analogy to the importance of DNA delivery for cancer therapy, which will be the main focus of my talk today. So we all know that cancer is a very daily disease. Um, in Singapore, one in about five people are at risk of developing cancer over their lifetime. And since 2015, there have been more than 9 million people dying each year due to cancer. And even though cancer mortality rate has been decreasing, however, with increasing number of cases each year, we have more and more people still dying of cancer. So there's a very promising uh, type of treatment known as cancer immunotherapy. And today I'm going to talk about one of them, uh, which is focused on using cells. Uh, the name of the therapy is called CAR T cell therapy, and CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. So let me try to use this schematic to explain how CAR T cell therapy works. First, uh, we will get um, the blood from the patient. And from this blood, there's a specific population of immune cells that we're trying to get. The immune cell is called T cells. And then through a process of transfection, we will deliver um, DNA or genes into these CAR T cells, uh, T cells to engineer them into CAR T cells. So you can imagine T cell and uh, consider them as a soldier. You know, they patrol in your body, fighting, uh, looking for mutated cancer cell to destroy. And after DNA transfection, they become a CAR T cell super soldier. They have enhanced ability to detect, recognize, and to kill the cancer cells. So after transfection, uh, we are able to get CAR T cells. Uh, next, we will grow the CAR T cells into a lot, into large numbers before re-injecting the CAR T cells into the patient for them to fight the cancer cells. So the transfection process is quite simple. Um, so there are mainly four steps. First, you need to package your cargo, like DNA, RNA, and protein. Next, the cargo has to cross the cell membrane. After that, the cargo must unpack within a cell membrane and enter the nucleus, especially if there are DNA, uh, for genome integration to happen. So if you think about you know, uh, DNA transfection and food delivery, uh, step one is very similar to, you, know, you need to pack your food, to pack your cargo. Um, the second step where the cargo is delivered across the cell membrane is where the food is delivered across the doors or gates of your home. Then uh, step three, where you unpack your food before eating is similar to uh, unpacking your cargo. And finally, as you enjoy your food, it's very similar to the cargo performing its function. So currently in market, um, virus vector is the most popular method to introduce DNA to generate CAR T cells. However, when we are using viral vector, some of this viral DNA can actually um, cause some immune reaction. And when this viral proteins are being expressed, they can also cause adverse immune reaction. And also interestingly, some viral vector can also randomly insert um, the gene. If they are inserting near a very active promoter, they can also enhance the risk of cancer, which is a bit ironic uh, because of the application that we are targeting. Um, next, when you think about viral vector from an engineering perspective, um, they also have very low cargo load. So imagine you're ordering food today, and depending on whether the uh, delivery man is coming on a cycle, but, motorcycle, a bicycle, or a car, the amount of food you can order um, each time is also very different. So likewise, uh, most viral vector has very limited cargo load of maximum 15 kilo base pair, and they can only deliver DNA or RNA. So imagine if you need an application with proteins, you will need to use viral vector with another type of reagent. So as a result of the limitation of virus, um, in the past 30 years, there's been a lot of um, technology um, and money invested to develop bulk electroporation. So this is a non-viral technique, it is cargo agnostic. So now let me try to explain how it works. In bulk electroporation, you will have the cells uh, suspended in the media. Next, we will apply very strong electric fields, about a few hundred kilovolts. Uh, what this does is that it creates a strong potential difference across the cell membrane that create which then create like small pores in the cell membrane. Um, with these pores, you know, the cargo outside of the cell can then randomly diffuse in. Um, but due to the use of very strong electric field, um, there's a lot of heating, uh, it can cause low cell viability. And also we have found that it can really perturb cell health. And this, the use of electroporation electro is analogous to a food delivery that destroys your home. 
So imagine you're trying to order a pizza, but the delivery man has to, you know, take down your window, take down your door in order to pass the pizza into your room. Um, I'm not, I'm sure this is not what you want. And similarly, um, this is not really what you want in terms of cell quality. So in my lab, we are developing all these high aspect ratio nanostructures. Um, as you can see here, so um, if you have been really following uh, the smartphone design, these are very simple. These are very similar to what you can find in your uh, semiconductor chips. So basically, we make use of technology, uh, manufacturing technology from the electronics industry to make these kind of nanostructures. So we are able to make a uh, hollow nanostructures like this, and we develop a technique uh, known as nanoelectron injection. So what, how this technique works is that uh, we use these um, nanostructures, and we have them very close to the cell that we are targeting, such as T cell. Uh, next, we apply electric field through each of these um, hollow nanotubes um, to open up very small membrane pores that can heal quite quickly. At the same time, when, because DNA is negatively charged, so by applying electric field, we can draw DNA directly into the cells uh, without relying on passive uh, diffusion, which is also quite random. And then we apply a magnetic force to improve DNA transport into the nuclei. Um, so I'll not go to too much into the mechanism, but uh, what I really want to show is that with this technology, we are able to offer a better um, DNA delivery efficiency than uh, the gold standard virus and port electroporation. And this technology works well for both fresh and also uh, cryopreserved or frozen T cells. Um, and it is actually much better than the state of the art technology right now, which is about 22%. But uh, when we talk about DNA delivery, uh, when you look through literature, people are always saying about, you know, we are getting 50%, 80%. But what we are seeing is that cell quality matters too. So you do not want to get a transfected cells, but they do not grow and they are not healthy. So very similarly, if you're ordering food delivery, I'm sure this is not something you want to see. Um, and the pizza as well. And this is from a real life example I had when uh, the pizza uh, ingredients were just like, you know, sweep to one side. So we, what we did was we actually conducted some very simple assay to look at how the cells perform after transfection. So generally um, in the cell, uh, if uh, they are very low fluorescent uh, calcium level, uh, but if they are stressed, you know, all this fluorescent uh, calcium level would then increase. What we found is that viruses and bulk electroporation do increase um, the intracellular calcium level, whereas in our case, um, our technique did not. And then we also found that uh, with our technology after transaction, uh, the cells were proliferating about 20 to 30% much faster uh, than transfection by viruses or by electroporation. And this is rather important because uh, expansion of cell is quite time consuming, expensive, and we want to minimize the duration. And um, finally, you know, uh, in summary, uh, this is we have developed a technology for cell transfection engineering, and we hope that this technology can help to reduce the price, um, the delay in terms of treatment so that patients can have a timely treatment and also try to enhance product robustness. Uh, but before I end the talk, I would also like to share about you know, um, that in each of our lab in BME, we all have a distinct um, culture in the lab. For example, in my lab, we emphasize a lot on outreach. So um, other than um, um, you know, sharing your talk in academic conference, we also find that it is really important uh, to talk to tertiary students from JCs, from polys, um, and so um, over the last few years, we have been doing a lot of Zoom um, science communication workshop. Recently, we have started a lot of in-person uh, like poster exhibition in, in libraries as well. We also really care, the department also really care about how we are teaching um, our, our students um, so that you know um, what they are learning um, from their graduate education is applicable for their career outcomes, whether they want to continue as a professor, whether they want to go to industry. Um, so uh, finally, I, I would like just to thank um, the different grant agencies for the support. And again, if you are interested to know more about the lab, um, you can scan the QR code and you'll bring it directly to the lab website where you can see like what we are doing in science and also in science outreach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. All right, so yeah, now we, we, uh, we are open for questions. So either questions to Andy or questions to any of the speakers here. Feel free to unmute and uh, ask your questions or you can type into the chat. I'll show the info on our slideshow as well. So, okay, here's our contact information, right? 
if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. So I think uh, there was a question uh, about, you know, I guess if you have very, very specific interests that may not be reflected in the research that Andy or myself presented, right? You can uh, feel free to look at the website uh, or department website. Um, and then also feel free to contact specific PIs that might be able to support your particular research interest. And um, I guess uh, there was also a comment that it was uh, a bit too deep, but you know, I think that um, what we're trying to really uh, share with this particular group is why we're doing what we're doing, not so much about the technical details, but you know, really trying to make a difference to patients, right? And how we actually treat diseases. So it's okay if it's too technical or too deep, but you know, like uh, Andy uh, mentioned, feel free to, to reach out to us through that website, email, and we'll be happy to share more about our research. Are there um, actually other like BME specialties that I guess uh, some of the, the, the applicants might be interested in? We can maybe like direct them to specific PIs. Would that help? Right, okay. Yeah, so these, these are some of the key areas that we have, right? So Andy, Eliza here represent, I guess, biomedicals and nanotechnology here. But uh, of course, BME is a very diverse area. So actually, I work on biomedical imaging. So if anyone is interested, you can answer. And Trello works on synthetic biology. So um, Tony, I think there was a question about kind of like a prerequisite, like, you know, what kind of background would be required, you know? So ah. given that BME is so broad, I think there's probably a concern that it may not necessarily have the right background. Right, right. So when we're talking about postgraduate research program, then you know, it is a specialized research, right? So depending on what your background, your interest is, we would suggest that you go through the, the list of a faculty member in BME and look at, you know, at the starting point, you know, the professor, you know, who shares a common interest with you and then they start from there. You know, our professors are very approachable and friendly. So feel free to just drop them an email. I think that's, you know, that's always a good place to start. Yeah. And, and of course, our website also has a lot of information. I think on our department website, there should be a contact, right, for, yeah. uh, for graduate studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll go to the, the contact so you can maybe note it down, right, the important website, and also, you know, for, for contacting uh, any of our professors or for the application process, right, if you're interested. All right, so yeah, uh, for those who want to, so we have two intakes, so January intake, this is actually, uh, the deadline is actually tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> so if, you're, if you're very interested, that's actually, you know, uh, very timely, this session. Uh, but if you're already in Singapore, the, the deadline for January intake is, uh, first of December. Okay. But uh, the biggest intake is actually the August uh, intake, the beginning of the, so in Singapore, the academic year starts from August. So if you want to join in August next year, then uh, first of January is the deadline for, for most uh, applicants, right? So international applicants. And also if you want to be prioritized for the scholarships. But uh, for applicants who are already in Singapore, then uh, the deadline can be a little bit later. Right? So 1st of January. And uh, another important thing for PhD study is uh, scholarship, right? funding for your PhD. And the deadline for these may actually be a little bit earlier. For example, a single scholarship Right, the deadline will be 1st of December uh, for, for joining in August uh, next year. Right? Yeah, uh, it's a graduate scholarship. So the deadline is actually, uh, there are multiple rounds, but the, the next upcoming deadline is actually in, in 1st of August. And there's an NUS uh, ISEP program. These, uh, 
I think the deadline is also flexible, but I think uh, for August intake, this could be uh, uh, 1st of December. Oh, th there's a question to Andy. Yeah, it's more like a comment. <laughs> oh, comment. <All> right. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. To me, I think I can also add that um, I think many of our colleagues uh -huh. are they hold joint appointments. So for uh -huh. example, uh, I guess yourself at MBI, um, you know, I get ND and I health tech, and they do also have their uh -huh. own scholarships, right? So I'm not sure yeah. whether I mean if you're if that helps in I mean in the in the in the spread of options that are available. So Eliza, how many students you have with your group? Uh PhD students, right? PhD uh, students. currently I I have uh, six. So they, they vary in there. I mean, there's a, there are some also on the, the precedent, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. what do you call that? Graduate fellowship. That's also one option, I guess, uh, that is mm -hmm. listed. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. They can apply to, to the MD. Yeah. How many students do you have, Andy? I have five PhD students now. Yeah. But uh, both of you are looking for new students next year, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, I, I guess it depends a lot on the candidate quality and also the grant situation, I uh, think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a dynamic process. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. Yeah. Uh, situation. Situation, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, we are mostly done with our presentations, okay. but uh, <laughs> if anyone has questions, please chime in. Tim, otherwise we will conclude this session soon. Thank you very much, uh, Eliza and Andy, for your time Thanks, and for no problem, sharing your very exciting research. And uh, for our participants, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. So yeah, I hope this give you, you know, some, some information about the exciting research that we have going on at uh, NUSBME. And we hope to see you uh, joining us in coming coming year, uh, coming semesters. So here are the uh, information, right? So more information about how to apply and important important timeline and so on. So uh, yeah, good luck for your for your you know current study and so also for your graduate study. And, Thing. That's all for today. No. Okay, thank you. Yeah, all right, thank, thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.